So today I'm going to talk about exchange rate determination. This is using the asset approach. This comes from the, the well-known Krugman, Osfeld, Mellitz International Economics textbook. I teach this in my international monetary theory classes. It's a it's pretty good model for understanding what causes exchange rates to move up and down based on both the fundamentals, macroeconomic determinants, as well as expectations, which are a big cause of those movements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of lay out the model in a way that explains the causes without being, um, we're kind of getting at some of the points that are a little little tricky for students. All right, so the main goal here is to uh, discuss what causes appreciations and depreciations, upward or downward movements in an exchange rate. This is the nominal bilateral rate. It's from the point of view of one country, but it's actually an exchange rate in terms of two countries at once, and so you can look at events at both in the economy and you know outside the economy uh, in, in the partner country as well. It's important to note this this model is based on interest rate parity. Um, it, it assumes perfect capital mobility and capital can move freely between the two countries with no barriers. In the real world, there are those barriers, but this is based on perfect capital mobility. And we're assuming that the two interest rates in the country should be the same. Um, at least the rates of return should be the same, and that economic forces will drive it toward that equilibrium. And like I like I mentioned. Uh, the causes of these movements are both fundamentals, which are essentially money supply, national income in both countries, and then I talk a lot about expectations. Good news can cause a currency to appreciate, and bad news can cause it to depreciate. Right. So let's talk about interest rate parity first. Um, so again, parity means equality. We're assuming that interest rates should be equal based on economic forces. Uh, but we're equalizing the expected rate of return. So investors who are investing, I mean, they have a choice of two countries. One, one country cannot pay more than the other. And so the rates of return, which is what they get both for interest and for the movements in the currency, should be equal across the two countries. Otherwise, all capital would flow out of the country with the low rate, and all capital would flow into the country with the high rate. All right, so you can kind of think of it in terms of supply and demand. Uh, if one country has higher rates, then demand goes up, the currency should appreciate, and the other currency would have low demand, and their currency would depreciate. But this, this gets at the same idea without supply and demand. It gets at it with a much more uh, economically driven mo model. Essentially, there are four variables. Home interest rate, we've got foreign interest rate, we've got today's exchange rate, and then we've got the expected future exchange rate. So time T is now, T plus one is the future, and we have th this E is for expectations. Now, of the three variables, all else equal, the one we're determining is today's exchange rate. So this is the thing that's going to move. Now, normally you think that the future is unknown. So if this is a year later, you might say, well, how do I know the future rate? Well, this assumes that the future is known, and it assumes that you know, it might be based on something like purchasing power parity or some model. Maybe there's a forecast out there. But you know the future, and today's exchange rate is going to move to restore equilibrium. So that's one point that sometimes students think is a little bit backwards. And right, so this is the variable that we're going to determine. Now, we can change any of these and shift the curves. But all else equal, this is the one variable we're going to determine. And the easiest way to look at this relationship is that the home interest rate is equal to the foreign interest rate plus the percentage appreciation of the foreign currency. So I can earn money in, in America if I'm an American, and I can earn a certain fixed amount that does not depend on the exchange rate. Because again, if I'm in the U.S. investing in the U.S., I'm never going to exchange money. But if I invest abroad, I have to kind of, one, I have to get the money and change it back. But as my money is sitting in a foreign country over a year, that it's, and if it's in euros, for example, if the euro appreciates, I'm going to have more money to turn back into dollars. If the euro depreciates, I'm going to have less. This could be negative. So this rate of return depends on both the interest I'm earning on my asset or on the exchange rate changing and ch causing that asset to, to be worth more just because the currency is worth more. All right. So here's my idea. So the expected rates of return should be equal. If one side's greater than the other side, this variable E is going to move to adjust. Now remember, you have exchange rates can be represented two ways. If, um, for example, uh, $1 is worth 20 pesos, so you could say that this would be 20. But if you flip it, you could say how much is one peso worth? It would be 0 0.05 dollars, so one twentieth of a dollar. So remember, this can be presented two different ways. So always note, I always say that the one that gets the, the kind of the point of view is the one on the bottom here. Okay, so this would be euros per dollar if the home currency is U.S. This would be dollars per euro, because again, the euro would be the foreign country. So this equation is a sort of another way of looking at the one um, that I just showed, it, only this is not in percentage terms. It kind of shows how these are going to be equal. 
So an American could invest, for example, $1,000 in the U.S. and earn 3% interest. All right, so this would be 1 plus 3%. Okay, and then your $1,000 times this would be 1,000 1, times 1 1.03. But if you're going to invest in Europe, you're going to earn 1.02. All right, and so we're going to earn, so that's the other interest rate here for 2% over the year. But that's a three-step process. If I'm an American, I need to take my money, I need to get euros, right, I exchange it, then over a year I'm going to earn interest, and at the end I'm going to exchange back how many dollars do I get per year, this is known, and these have to be equal. And the economic forces that, that equalize that um, have to do with those capital movements. Right? If, if the U.S. paid too much, then this actually would have to go uh, down to equalize it. Right? Or this would actually, the dollar would actually have to go up, and the euro would have to go down. And um, it's important to remember that up and down kind of depend on which currency you're looking at. But if this side's too high, this is going to actually have to go up. But this, is, this uh, as we're going to see, is actually this going up is the dollar going up. And that's important to know. And that's one big uh, outcome from this. And you can see it on the past slide, too. If the U.S. raises rates, the dollar should rise. Okay? If the U.S. lowers rates, the dollar should fall and the euro should rise. All right, so an American can invest over here, earn 1.03 or 3% extra, but they're going to buy euros, earn interest in euros, and then turn those euros back to dollars. Right. So these have to be equal. So if you put a, if you put the numbers in here, you're going to get a thousand times 1.03 has to equal a thousand, and that's kind of left off. This would actually cancel out. But this is the exchange rate, right? T and this is the interest part, and this is the known value that I'm saying is 1.11 dollars per euro. So one one euro would be worth a dollar and eleven cents. So you can solve for e algebraically, and if you try it, you're going to find out that the answer is 0.91 euros per dollar. Okay, so that's the value. This is the exchange rate. If you raise or lower any of these, this answer is going to change, and that's what makes the exchange rate move. All right, so here's our equation again, and we can write it as either this, which is the, the parts that make up the rate of return, or you can say expected rate of return at home is equal to the expected rate of return in foreign, and only this one depends on the exchange rate. So um, to look at it through this equation, if home interest rate is 3% and foreign interest rate is 2%, then we know that the foreign currency must appreciate by 1% over the course of time of that year. And so the only way an investor would invest in Europe is if they knew the exchange rate would rise and kind of make up for that missing percent. Right, and so you get that percentage change off the gap between the exchange rate today and the exchange rate tomorrow. Now, as I mentioned before, if home raises rates to 4%, then this is still 2. Now this has to be 2%, and so foreign needs to rise by 2%. And I kind of mentioned that, that that number is going to change so that it's even, in terms of the dollar, it's going to be higher, but in terms of euros, it's going to be lower. We know the euros are worth a dollar eleven cents. So if the U.S. raises rates, the euro has to fall so that it can rise by 2% over that year. So the equation makes it look smaller, um, but if you look at it upside down, it's actually going up. Okay, so that's the big takeaway, and that's one thing the graph will help us see. So here's our model. E, the expected rate of return, ERRH, is just the home interest rate. This is independent of E. We notice on our axis that this is the exchange rate home for foreign. This is usually left blank, but this is actually ERR. All right, but this is the one variable we're going to determine. One important thing to notice is that this is actually, if you think of the dollar, you think up would be a valuable dollar, but the way this book does it is that down, and downward movement is an increase in the value of the dollar. So down is a stronger dollar, up is a stronger euro. Even if you're thinking of this as a graph for the U.S., down means more valuable. So that's a little bit backwards, too. All right. So this is an independent relationship, that's just the interest rate that was given, but this is the relationship that depends on the, the exchange rate. So it's independent of the exchange rate here, this one is dependent on the exchange rate. So remember, up here is a strong foreign currency, right? a strong euro, and what this is saying is that if the euro is strong, it doesn't have much room to rise. Right? It's already strong. It's not going to go up more. So that rate of return is going to be either low or even negative. It might be too strong. You see, what comes up must come down. It's got to fall. So a strong euro or strong foreign currency means that it's actually going to either not rise much or fall. And so the rate of return an investor will expect is much lower.
right? But a weak foreign currency means that it's got a lot of room to rise. And if it's going to rise, that means that investors will make money as their investments abroad appreciate. So that's where the downward slope comes from, is that there's a relationship between a strong foreign currency and a low rate of return, or a weak foreign currency and a high rate of return. Obviously, this is the equilibrium. This crossing point gives us today's exchange rate. All right, so let's do a shift. Home raises the rate of, the rate of return, raises interest rates, as I mentioned before, maybe from 3 to 4%. You can draw it like this. You can see that the rate of return goes up. It's a, it's a rightward shift in the line, but look at the crossing point down here. Okay, so this means that you're going down to the new crossing point. That is a stronger home currency or a weaker foreign currency. In other words, if the U.S. raises rates, the euro should fall and the dollar should rise relative to each other. All right, so here's the math behind it. So I, this is actually a range of, of what the euro could be trading at at any one point in time. And this is the inverse. Right, this is simply 1 over this number. And this is a target that I made up of 1.11. So again, this is the future value that is known by investors. Here's the 3% and the 2%. This is just the difference. I want to show you it's a 1% interest differential. A lot of times people say that interest rate differentials drive currency movements. So if you go from the known number to here, it's, a it's roughly 3.44%, but it's actually a downward movement, right? The euro is worth $1.15. Now it's in the future, it's worth $1.11. It's lost. Now, depending on which numbers you use, you might get slightly different numbers, but it, and it might be rounded a little bit different, but this is pretty much the relationship you can see. A strong euro has a low rate of return, right? It's actually negative, but a weak euro has a strong rate of return. In fact, this could be the vertical axis, and this is that downward slope. It starts low, and it goes high. Now, look where they cross. The U.S. pays 3%. If you add up the two components, European interest rate, which is 2, the change in the currency, right, that's the second component is 1, add those up, you get 3. The crossing point is at 3 and 3, and so we can say that our equilibrium exchange rate right now in this model is $1.10. Now, if we raise U.S. interest rates to 4%, look what happens. The dollar gets stronger. The euro gets weaker, right? The dollar is now worth 0.92 euros. The euro is only worth $1.09. But look where they the cross. This is now 4%. This gap is 2%, roughly, and again, I'm rounding, and it's 4.11. It doesn't quite line up. Maybe it's going to be a little bit in between, but roughly it's close to 4%, and so 4 and 4 are the same. And uh, our, our equilibrium exchange rate has actually become weaker for the euro and stronger for the dollar. All right. Now, let's look at this one. This is a rise in expectations. This means it could be good news for Europe. Right? Because you could say, well, you know, investors think it was worth $1.11. Now maybe it's a good political situation, good economic forecast. Something makes investors think the euro is going to be worth more. All right, so we're going to actually change this, which changes our exchange rate change over here. So if you raise it, you can see now all these percentages change, and it's basically like a rightward shift. All the rates of return become higher, right? It was negative here, now it's positive. It's a rightward shift. And if you look, nothing else has changed. This is 3%, 2%, the gap is still 1%, but now the percentage change is 1, right? So 2 plus 1, here's 3. So 3 and 3 are equal. But the new equilibrium interest rate, excuse me, the equilibrium exchange rate is a stronger euro and a weaker dollar. A euro is worth an extra cent, and a dollar is worth one less euro cent. Right? So you can say good news for Europe, shifts ERR to the right, and now the new crossing point is here. And so then again, that's a stronger euro and a weaker dollar. Now finally, where does this interest rate come from? Okay, So we've got the exchange rate here, and this is based on the interest rate. This comes from the money market. So you might have seen this graph elsewhere. This is the real money supply. This is real money demand. The liquidity function says that interest rates go down with, so if interest rates go down, money demand goes up. All right, so this is the money demand function. Another thing you could say is that if income goes up, which is why, then the whole thing shifts right. So an increase in income leads to higher interest rates. So this is the liquidity function, which is a real money demand function. Now notice this is R and this is R. So all we're going to do is we're going to rotate it. Turn it on its side. You can actually move this down to here. Line them up. My axis is a little bit off, but you know, still, still pretty close. You can see here. Interest rate is where money supply and money demand cross, and that gives us the line that gives us the expected rate of return at home. 
right? So the crossing point, the intersection or equilibrium in the money market gives us the expected rate of return at home. Now, if we do what we did, we are going to basically raise interest rates by cutting the money supply. So the U.S. follows contractionary policy, contracts the money supply, which raises rates. And you can see here, here's the less money supply, here's the higher rate, and the, the exchange rate has gone down, right? But that's actually a stronger dollar. So all the things that we said with the equations and with the math, with the simpler model and with these two models combined say the same thing. If the U.S. raises rates, the dollar rises. Here we back up a step and say, how do you raise rates? You cut the money supply through open market operations. And you sell bonds, low, reduce money supply, interest rates go up, and the end result is here. The exchange rate goes down, and remember, up and down are flipped, so that's actually a stronger dollar. So if the, if the U.S. raises rates, money supply appreciates. So what do we see? Well, we use the exchange rate model, which is more complicated than supply and demand. It's basically called the asset approach because we're talking about <coughs> equilibrium in the asset market, and we're talking about what investors value. And so they value an equilibrium where the return to assets are the same regardless of the country. And the one variable that changes is today's exchange rate. And if any other, t if any other variable changes, whether it's today, uh, today's um, interest rate at home, today's foreign interest rate, or uh, the future expectation, which is a fixed quantity, if anything changes, this value will change. And so we talked about a change at home interest rates, and I talked about expectations. Now, personally, I spend a lot of time talking about expectations and good and bad news, because if you see the volatility of exchange rates, it, exchange rates move much more than interest rates do. Uh, central banks don't move them that often. So I think investors a lot of times are, are looking at them like, like a stock forecast and using all available information minute by minute to make forecasts of the future. So this could be changing more than these two, but that's kind of more my approach of this. But end result is we have a model that shows us what happens if that good news happens for a country their currency should rise or monetary policy that says if interest rates change, their currency will rise or fall as well.